Well, good morning, Grace family. Wherever you are right now, whomever you are with right now, we have an opportunity to draw near to God this morning. God is near. He's always here. And if you've put your trust in the saving work of Jesus, His Spirit is in you, always at work. Think of that. That's amazing. And you are in Christ. All that Christ has done for you has resulted in your being holy and blameless in God's sight. And so today, let's approach God with confidence, knowing we are fully accepted and loved. We are His church, a gathering of God's people, not a utopian community, not a group of perfect people, that's for sure. All you have to do is look under the hood and you'll see that there's lots of messiness with us, right? It's important we're mindful of that reality because if we expect the church to fit some romanticized ideal of ours, we will inevitably be disappointed because, well, it's us. Or if we see the church with a consumer mindset, we will miss out on what God has for us as well. I really like how Eugene Peterson describes the church. He puts it this way. The church is a Holy Spirit-shaped context for growing up in Christ. So let's give ourselves to this time. Let's grow together with an open heart and with a spirit of receptivity. And remember, we're in this together. So will you pray with me? Lord, you have made us what we are, not by our own effort or will, but by your will and the efforts of Jesus. We are your saints. That's incredible. Not a word that feels very comfortable to us, nor is it a word that we would likely choose for ourselves. It feels too holy, too perfect, too grand. But if that's what we are in your eyes, then give us eyes to see it, to see this holiness in us and in your people in the company of your saints throughout history and right here in our own church at Grace. We are yours, Father, so have your way with us. For the sake of your name, we pray this in the name of Jesus, who made this all possible. Amen.
So we'll be continuing our study today in Ephesians with Ephesians 1, 7 through 14. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. So this fall, we are walking through Ephesians 1 through 3, and so far, we are just exploring all these spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And so last week we looked at the blessing of God the Father who, who chose us to be holy and blameless in His sight. And this morning we're going to look at the blessing of God the Son and the blessing of God the Spirit. And really what we have is the gospel is this, that, that God has sent His Son and His Spirit. It's the gospel of His Son and Spirit. God has sent his son to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And then he sent his spirit to do in us what we could never do in ourselves. So this morning we're going to look at the blessings of the son and of the spirit. So let's start with the ministry of Jesus, the son of God. And you see it just put succinctly and beautiful in verse 7. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And I think in using that language, Paul is echoing two Old Testament images, two really Old Testament stories. So first that phrase, redemption through his blood. That phrase echoes the whole story of the Exodus, where you had the Israelites who were in slavery, who were in bondage in Egypt, and they were redeemed through the blood. And most of you know this story, but they were subjected to harsh labor, harsh treatment by the Egyptians. And the word that is often used in that story is that they experienced the yoke of slavery. And a yoke is just this big, you know, wooden bar put on oxen when they're, you know, moving through the fields. And so that's what they experienced, this this weight, the, the, the weight of oppression, of forced labor, of slavery, the weight of powerlessness and injustice. And what God did for them, of course, is he heard their cry and he redeemed them. He he lifted that yoke off of their shoulders and he did it through the blood. In that case, through the blood of the Passover lamb. God performed these 10 great miracles. We know them as the 10 plagues. And on the 10th plague, where he was going to destroy the firstborn males in Egypt, he had all the Israelite families take a lamb a perfect unblemished lamb and slaughter it and smear its blood on their doorposts so that when the angel of the Lord came through to destroy the firstborn, he would see the blood and he would pass over that household. And so it's through that 10th plague that God brought redemption. That was the one that convinced Pharaoh to finally let them go. And so they were redeemed through the blood, by the blood of the Passover lamb. And it's really this beautiful picture of the ministry of Jesus in our lives. Because the reality is, like the Israelites, we too were in bondage. We were in bondage to our own sin. We bore a yoke. And any of us who have experienced any level of sin, we know what that yoke feels like, that that oppressive weight that comes from our sin, from our brokenness, and the bondage, the addiction, and the shame and the guilt that we all in our own ways have experienced over the years through our own sin and brokenness. We are bound by it. But the beautiful thing is that Jesus has now redeemed us and he has done it through his blood. And what he does is he takes on himself our yoke, that heavy weight 
that weight of shame and guilt and sin, he carries it himself and he carries it to the cross. And on the cross, he pays the penalty for all of that. And by doing so, he redeems us. He releases us. He frees us from that yoke of sin and shame. And the word for freedom that Paul uses in this, in this, in this verse, verse 7, is the word, the forgiveness of sins. He frees us by bringing forgiveness. And I know that we hear that word all the time. And so I think that has become an over-familiar word for us. But it's helpful to know, actually, that in the first instance, that is not a religious word. Like when it's first used, it doesn't have a spiritual meaning. The word simply means to release. It means to let go. That's just what the word forgiveness means, simply to release. And so that conjures up another Old Testament um, image or idea. It was actually an idea that we see when God brought these slaves into their own promised land and gave them a set of laws. And one of the laws he gave them was to institute what he called a year of jubilee. And what this was is every 50 years, it would be a year of jubilee, a year of release, of forgiveness. And what would happen is anyone who had debts, all debts, it's a pretty amazing concept, all debts were released every 50 years. And any slaves were released from their slavery every 50 years, whether they'd had to, you know, sell themselves into slavery for financial need. On the 50th year, they were released. And all property, all land was released back to its original ancestral owners. And so every 50 years, there was just this big reset in, in Israel. There was a release which would help people get out from under the crushing burden of like, you know, generational debt or long-term poverty or slavery. This beautiful year of jubilee, of release. And that's a great image also for what Jesus has done for us through forgiveness. He has ushered in the year of jubilee. Only it's not a year every 50 years, but it is the new covenant. The new covenant is this perpetual year of jubilee, of release from all of our sins. And so that sense of obligation, that sense of debt that so many of us carry, right, because of our brokenness and sins, that sense of we've got to do something to make up for this. We've got to figure out a way to, to deal with that. The beauty is that the ministry of Jesus releases us from all that debt and obligation. He ushers us into a jubilee time with our Lord, which says there's no condemnation. Nothing more needs to be done because I have already paid off all your debts through my own blood on the cross. And so all that to say, this is, this is the ministry of God the Son, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to redeem us, to release us from that yoke, from the bondage of sin and the obligations it lays on us before a holy God. And I know that that is all probably very familiar for almost all of us. But I just want to remind us that um, we need to celebrate that regularly. Like we need to celebrate our redemption, our release, our forgiveness. I love King David celebrates that in Psalm 32. He says, how blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven? How blessed is the one whose sins the Lord will never count against them? What a marvelous truth to remember every day, whose sin the Lord will never count against them. That is jubilee. I was reminded this week of a story that I think it's C.S. Lewis tells. It may have been another author, but he tells this, just this simple story, this moment of being reminded of the truth that I just shared. And, you know, he was in the high church, so he went to an Anglican church. So every Sunday they would recite the creeds. And he tells this beautiful moment of one morning reciting the creeds that he recites every Sunday, but just being floored by the reality of this truth. And the creed goes like this, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins. And somehow in that morning, saying that out loud, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. The reality of that struck him like, oh my gosh. This is true. I believe in this reality. There is a release from our sins and we get to live in it every day of our lives. 
And we need to celebrate that. We need to remind ourselves, we need to wake up every morning and say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in Jubilee and all because of the ministry of Jesus. And so we need to celebrate our forgiveness, but we also need to celebrate God's son, Jesus, every day. The lamb who was slain, who purchased by his own blood a people who are released and forgiven and freed. So that's the ministry of God the Son, put simply, shortly. And now let's turn to the ministry of God's Spirit. Uh, God not only sends His Son to do for us what we can't do for ourselves, but He sends His Spirit then to do in us what we can't do in ourselves. And we get the ministry of the Spirit in verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Now, we spent almost five months earlier this year talking about the ministry of the Spirit, so we won't take too much time today. But Paul basically summarizes his ministry in two words in this passage, and I want to talk about both these two words. Each of them carries, a, I think, a pretty cool image. So the first um, image is in verse 13 when it says, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Or just literally, you were sealed. And Paul is giving us a first century image of a seal. And so you have to imagine, you know, like someone writing a letter back in the day on papyrus or whatever they wrote on, and then folding that, and then taking that, you know, melted wax, putting it on there, and then having a ring, and then stamping the wax with their ring. That's, that's a seal. They've got their unique signet ring and it seals the letter shut. That's the image. And in the first century, the, the, the seal would convey two things. One, it would convey ownership, right? It would, it would be like, oh, this letter clearly belongs to Paul of Damascus, or whoever, right? That's, that's his seal. I recognize that. So it, it conveys this letter is from Paul. It, it, it belongs to Paul. And it's authentic. It's, it's not a forgery. This is the real thing. It's, it's got its seal on it. And then the other thing that the seal would do would, would, would uh, guarantee security, essentially. Right? If you received a letter and the seal hadn't, be broken, hadn't been broken, you know, okay, no one's tampered with this letter. No one's opened it and changed the contents. I can trust. This is secure. And Paul is saying, he's using that image to say, that's what the Holy Spirit is for us. So in the image, you know, we are like the letter. God is the author, and the Holy Spirit is his seal that he puts on us. And what that does is those two things. First, it, it, uh, it marks us as his own. It declares God's ownership of us, and it declares our authenticity of, as sons and daughters of the king. God marks us by giving us his own personal presence to live inside of us. That's what his spirit is. And that tells us we belong to him. He owns us, and and we are authentic children of God. So it's a sign of of ownership and authenticity, and then it's a sign of security, too. The fact that He's given us His Holy Spirit guarantees, like a letter, that we will reach our final destination. In our case, the destination is eternal life. And so the Spirit is is the one who comes in. He he secures us. He protects us, right? He, He keeps us safe through all of our lives so that we do, in fact, reach eternal life. Paul says it in Philippians, right? He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. And that's the the Spirit is His security. Like, I'm, I'm protecting you. I will see you through every stage of your life so that you arrive in eternity. And I, I just love the comfort that comes from that. I'm so grateful that that my future security is not dependent on me continuing to do things well, because I don't trust myself. But my future security is dependent on the Holy Spirit of God marking me as his own, and he's going to protect me, and he's going to protect you all the way through this journey. So it's this beautiful picture of a seal, and that, that then leads to the second image for the Holy Spirit, which you see in verse 14, where he says this, the Holy Spirit who is the, here's the second image, the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. So here the image is one of a deposit. So this is a financial 
uh, image. And so we would maybe use a word instead of deposit, we could use deposit or a down payment or even you know earnest money. This is basically money that someone deposits that says whatever they're, they wanna purchase, whether it's a house or something else, it says, hey, this deposit guarantees I'm serious about this purchase, right? I'm, I'm in, I'm all in. I'm, I'm guaranteeing that I'm good for the whole amount and that I really want the house. And this deposit is my telling you, I'm really serious about this. And of course, the deposit is also a portion of the full payment, right? Here, this is 10%. This is a, a taste of what's to come, right? Like this is part of the full payment. It's the first installment of more to come. So it is both uh, a guarantee and it is a taste of what is to come. And that's a really beautiful image for the Holy Spirit, right? He is first and foremost, the guarantee of our future inheritance. God is basically saying, I am guaranteeing you eternal life. And the way I'm doing that is by I'm putting my own presence within you. I have given you my own spirit, which tells you I'm in on you. I'm committed to you. <laughs> uh, I'm committed to your eternal happiness. And this is my deposit. This is my down payment guaranteeing my commitment to you. So it's his, it's his guarantee, but it's also a taste. It's a foretaste of eternal life, right? He's saying, I'm going to give you a taste of eternal life now by giving you my own presence. So really what the Holy Spirit is, he is a taste of eternity now. He's a taste of the future, what we're going to experience in eternal life. We get a glimpse of that. We get a taste of that even now because of the Spirit's presence in our lives. And I just find that a really cool and uh, maybe a better word would be a, a comforting reality. And I, I just think about like when we when we experience the Spirit in our lives, I want you to think of times where you've experienced God's Spirit. Meaning such as like when certain promises of God that you've heard many times, you kind of up here, when the Spirit makes those real and you begin to experience a promise of God or a, a, a characteristic of God, it's like it becomes so real to you because His Spirit is, is doing something in you. Or when He reminds you of who you are, like when he reminds you of his love for you or the, or the fact that you are, you are his beloved son or daughter and you feel that in your bones, you experience it. Or when he opens your eyes even some, to like the beauty of his creation or the beauty of, of his family here through friends and people you get to be with. When the spirit is at work, um, having those moments, that's this guarantee. God has committed himself to me. And that means I'm going to be with him for all eternity. And those moments are also glimpses of what eternal life is going to be like. And I just love that because I, I would say moments that I look back on in my own life where I feel like the Spirit has really moved and been clearly at work in my life. I mean, those are some of my most comforting, most important, deepest, most beautiful moments in my entire life. And so it's a really comforting thought to, to realize, oh, those are, those are like glimpses. Like those are just like imperfect, but you know, like not fully there, but glimpses of what maybe eternal life will be like. And that's a great thought. And again, just as with the Son, we need to celebrate these things. We need to celebrate the fact uh, that God is not far off, that He has filled us with His own Spirit, His own presence, which means we belong to Him and we are protected by Him and He will see us through, through the end of our lives. So good. All right, so to wrap this up, just stepping back, these past two weeks, we have been looking at the blessings of our triune God. <laughs> the fact that we've been chosen by God the Father before the creation of the world. The fact that we've been redeemed by God the Son. And the fact that we've been sealed and that we are protected by God the Spirit. We are so deeply blessed. And we need to just sit in those blessings. We need to internalize them. We need to let them shape our lives. So let me leave you uh, with an image. And here's how I think about this. Uh, what God has done, the gospel is this. What God has done in response to a broken world is that he has sent the world his two greatest gifts. <laughs> he has sent the world the gift of his son and he has sent the world the gift of his spirit, which is really to say he has sent the world the gift of himself. And so the image that I always picture is this, that that if there's a broken world out there, it's the image of God who has reached out to the world with his son. 
and is reached out to the world with his spirit. And so we, we have in him th- this God who is reaching out to us, who is saying, I long for you. I want relationship with you. I want to welcome you into my life. This God who doesn't meet us halfway, but who goes all the way in the person of his son and his spirit to make a way for us to have fellowship with him and to experience life the way he designed our lives to be. And so I want to leave you with this image of this God who in in all these beautiful ways has reached out to you with his very self and who longs to now draw you in to life with him. And the question I want to leave you with as you consider that image is, is maybe just this. As you think of him reaching out in this way, it'd be just to ask you, where do you need to say yes to this God today? Like this offer, this embrace that he offers you, where, where do you just need to say, yes, God, I say yes to that embrace? Where do you need to maybe return to him? Where do you need to come home to him if he's the prodigal father in that great par- parable? Where is it that you need to come home to him in some fresh way? And maybe there's an, there's an area in your life where you have been walking away from him. Maybe not your whole life, but there's an area where you've been walking away. Or maybe there's an area where you're just, Um, You're keeping him at what you would consider a safe distance or an area that you've kind of compartmentalized and you've closed off to him where you might need to just see his embrace and say, hey, return to me. Come home. I love you. I'm offering myself to you. Where do you need to come home? Where do you need to experience jubilee with your God? And what we're going to do now, we're going to, we're going to sing a song. And it's just this invitation to come to God in the midst of our brokenness. And so I'd invite you, you can sing it, but maybe you don't even want to sing it. Maybe you just want to reflect as Joel and Scott sing this song. You want to reflect on this invitation. Consider where you need to come home to your God. Let's sing, Come Ye Sinners. <laughs> Yeah.
Well, we hope that you've been encouraged by this morning's message. And as always, we would invite you to consider the reflection questions that we'll put on the screen right after this. And let me leave you with this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.